We're extremely optimistic. It's gonna be great. I'm excited. Let's do it. Man. I'm fired up. Already. It's time to let the dog eat, bro. <laughs> Describe it the same way. 15, 10, a hurdle! Oh man! Touchdown! Like there's so much dog in me right now that's ready to eat. I would say that I'm I'm very excited. What a play! Jamal yeah. just did it a little more colorfully. This is like the season of life right now. It's exciting, man. I'm, I'm like bored of everything else. Touchdown, BYU! I just want it to be August so bad. Just looking forward to the opportunity. Ah. Get me down there to UCLA. Get me to Nebraska now. I want to play them and I want to dominate. I mean, we get to go to the Rose Bowl. Ah. Nebraska. Oh, yeah. The Arrowhead. We get to go to the big house. There is culture that hasn't been here before. There is senior leadership that hasn't been here before. Best players at the right positions with the best leadership that's never been here before. And man, it's, it's tough to be this when it's that way. Hi there, everybody, and welcome to this special edition of Sports Beat College Football Preview. Now, for the next three weeks, we will devote this time to get you ready for the Utes, Cougars, and Aggies 2015 football season. Jeremiah, tonight, though, it's all about the Cougars. Yeah, the Cougars return several key starters, including Taysom Hill and Jamal Williams. They need them to stay healthy as they face a daunting schedule, but with that challenge comes a tremendous opportunity. I mean, we say it every day, beat Nebraska, beat Nebraska. I mean, right now we're just looking at Nebraska. Growing up, I watched Nebraska play. We're just working out every day for Nebraska. So I'm excited to go play against them now and to be in the atmosphere. Uh, nothing better. That's what, that's what we all want. A look from the Goodyear blimp down in the Rose Bowl. And I think if you'll ask our team, they'll say, man, we love those games. We want more of them. I'm very excited about it. Right, there's, when I look at it, I, I think of opportunity. Man, I'm really excited, you know, that's, that's something we dream, at, dream of as we're kids. Oh man, it's a great, great opportunity. But you go into Arrowhead Stadium, you go into the big house and you show them up, you show these, these great teams up, people are going to respect you, they're going to be like, oh, who's that, you know? And it's just, like you said, it's a big opportunity to make big plays. Very excited. Very excited. I think it's great that we built this schedule for this this year. There's also a possibility of a huge return and an amazing college football experience. Big Red Country has been waiting for and Husker football. We don't have any time to waste. You know, we're just trying to work as hard as we can right now and that we have to be ready right off the bat. In years past, we've sometimes struggled, you know, in our first few games and that can't happen this year. You can't start slow. You can't be feeling your way through that first week. I mean, you have to know who you are, know the team you're playing, uh, you have to be ready. I see it as a big opportunity. We're all talking about how last year wasn't us and now just give us a chance to prove it. Yeah, for case of 20, 15, 10, a hurdle, oh man, touchdown, what a play! Everything's just building on itself so that we can hit the ground running and really be ready to, to take on those, those first four games in the whole season. We know what's ahead and we want to be prepared when it comes and uh, I believe we will be. I mean, it's going to be a tough schedule, don't get me wrong, but we're, we're working hard, and um, we're going to be ready. Beg your pardon, Mitchell Juergens loses a bubble off his chest, a loose ball fight. You know, a lot of people have doubts. Um, obviously, it's a tough schedule, and um, I think that just adds to the excitement. We're going to be uh, giving people trouble, for sure. I want growth, I want progress, I want change. And so I'm going to schedule our way into that and hopefully help our team play our way into that. I think it would be easy to say or easy to look at it and be like, man, like bring a little anxiety, right? But I think where we're at as a football team with the guys that we have coming back, it's, it's a great opportunity. We are now joined by the voice of the Cougars, Greg Rebell. And Greg, this schedule is daunting, especially in September. How does this schedule compare to others that BYU have had historically? Well, since BYU has gone independent, you're going to see three to five regular season P5s in every schedule, and they're sitting at four right now. It's not so much the number of teams, it's, it's who they are and where you're playing them. And it's away, away, away is what it turns out to be. You're at Nebraska, you're at UCLA, you're at Michigan, three of the most storied venues in college football, and you get them all in the first month of the season. Then later in the year, you play Missouri in Kansas City, close enough to be an away game. And what you're going to find when 
when BYU finishes the 2015 season is they will have played 10 of their last 11 P5 opponents away from home. And Bronco knows that's kind of the setup right now. They'd like to have more games in Provo, but he's kind of a, you know, he's in a situation to say wherever they'll play, we'll play them, and that's what you see this year. Two years ago, they had a difficult schedule, the number of P5 teams. They finished 8-5 and five that year. Will 8-5 and five be good enough for this season? I am completely responsible. That's my fault. Intercepted! It's a cut for a touchdown by the Bulls. And now 21 unanswered points by UNR. Capitalizing on our mistakes. Every coach and every player was equally as responsible for what you saw. Incomplete! And the Knights have won it in overtime. And the game is going to be over. They want to improve and they'll be anxious to play again. Eight and five is a nice season at some schools, but at BYU, it's just not good enough. The players know it, and they're determined to improve on that mark, especially the seniors. Kind of the ring leader, I would say, in that discussion has been Coach Menahal. Flat out told us, like, eight and five is not okay. Man, I, I am tired of going eight and five, and so is everybody else that's been here for three years. We sit in the locker room, and eight and five discuss us. We always talk about it. Eight and five is not something we won't. You know, eight and five, you're right. It's, it's unacceptable. Three years in a row of eight and five, um, and we're not pleased. Fans aren't pleased, um, and so we need to get back on track. Time to throw over the middle. Intercepted. It's over. It's frustrating because we know we could have won. We should have won. And it's just those plays that keep going back in your mind that you wish you could get back and do the right thing, you know? There were games that we should have won last year. Stu in the pocket, throws while being hit, it is incomplete. There are no flags, and the Knights have won it in overtime. I mean, it makes our piss hot, and we want to get out there, and we, you know, we want to do a lot better than that for ourselves, not necessarily for anyone else. It is weight lifted, and we're tired, but we still got a little more to go. First thing come out of my mind is we don't want another eight and five season. Eight and five is no more. Ten plus is what we gonna get. Ten plus, that's exactly what we gonna do. So being able to um, have this great opportunity this year with the schedule that we have, uh, there's nothing better. So we're excited just to go out and prove ourselves. I just felt like the mindset wasn't there. Um, we didn't really hold ourselves to a high standard. I just feel like this year we're just like I said, we just got a chip on our shoulder. We just want to get on the field and do some work. And we really want to win every game, but we got to start 10 plus. We have to know that we're going to do it. We're going to be positive about everything. So I, I think the thing that will be key for us is staying healthy. If we, if we stay healthy, um, and then kind of my mentality, my mindset going into this season is give ourselves an opportunity to win every football game. Me and Taysom have haven't put one whole season together healthy. We put 30 to put together, but one year I was hurt, one year he was hurt, the other year he was hurt. So it's, we want to put that together, couple that with Jamal, and it'll be a special year for us being good buddies and to be able to look back and say we left that on the line with each other, for each other, and man, it'll be a special year. Eyes are going to be on us. There's going to be 100,000 in Michigan, nearly 100,000 in Nebraska. Huge stadium, UCLA, Missouri, and NFL Stadium. We are placed where we need to be placed for eyes to be on us, and we need to accomplish that by, by winning and capturing all that. All right, Greg, the goal is always 10 plus wins in Broncos' first five years. Four 10 plus win seasons since then, just one. How do you account for that, and what do they have to do to reverse that trend? Well, you could argue that the most recent seasons, as independent seasons, have had a little more difficulty to them uh, with more P5s in the mix, maybe some softer games as Mountain West Conference members. But that aside, um, it, it, it is 8-5 and five for three straight years. Now, you know, not to be all Pollyanna about this, but last year's season wasn't that far away from 10 wins. Um, I look at the UCF game, and I look at the Memphis game. Uh, and, and with a couple of occurrences, literally only one or two occurrences, you can turn that eight wins into 10 wins pretty easily. And that's without Taysom Hill for most of the year and Jamal Williams for much of the year. Uh, Mike Tyson has famously said, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth, and everyone's got a plan until you lose Taysom and Jamal. That said, they recovered to play some pretty good football, and again, eight to ten wins wasn't too much of a big, uh, too much of a difference last season. Well, and with some of the injuries that took place, they got a lot of experience, the underclassmen, to help out this year, too, so you can factor that in as well. So, eight and five, good or bad in your opinion? 
I think eight and five would be considered a bit of a letdown for this year's team. Uh, with a senior quarterback and a senior running back in year three of the Robert and I era, Bronco back on defense, I think expectations are higher despite the difficulty of schedule. I mean, you, you could say there's five losses on this schedule, but I think they'd be let down by it. Okay, we're going to talk to you uh, further. We're going to break down the offense when we come back. We have the guys, we have the experience, and so we can do what we did last year easily. What can we expect from Taysom Hill and Jamal Williams as they return from injuries? The offense continued to improve in year two under offensive coordinator Robert and I, averaging 37 points per game. They did so despite injuries to Taysom Hill and Jamal Williams. If both are healthy, expect even bigger numbers in 2015. I do believe our guys coming back this year have a lot to prove. And at the 15 to 10, Taysom stays on his feet and is into the end zone. My standard has always been do what we did last year and then a little bit more. Twins to either side, hand off to ball. Ball easily into the end zone. So many things we could do. Uh, me, Taysom in general, but people who've been there when we were injured still make it plays. Beyond confident, like, uh, it's no question. Throwing deep, looking for Mitch Matthews. There's a push off, there's a flag. This next year is not just going to be good enough just to do well. I think those guys uh, want something. You know, I think they have something to prove. All those big numbers, all those big plays, everything, they don't mean anything if you don't get a win. We need to make it better because, you know, people keep talking about you know, how great the offense was last year, but 37 points is, if you look at the best teams in the country, it's just okay, right? Like, you look at Baylor, they were in the 50s. You look at Oregon, they were in the 50s. You look at Florida State scoring tons of points. They're scoring tons of points, they're winning more games. So 37 is a great start, but that's not good enough to carry us into 11-2 season, 12-1, and 13-0. That's not good enough, you know? So. We, uh, us three leaders, me, Jamal, and Taysom, need to make sure that 37 is a bad game, not our best game. You guys had a lot of production in the past game. Are you confident that Taysom can come back and have that type of production in the past game? Uh, am I confident in that? Uh, there's no doubt in my mind uh, that, that that'll be the case. But, uh, I don't believe we've really proven ourselves throwing the ball. Now, not like... Uh, you know, some of those offenses with John Beck and Max Hall, you know, 300 yards a game was, you know, for those guys, oh man, that's a disappointment. We haven't proved that we are a real threat throwing the football, especially to the level that uh, has been around here in, in years past. We have the guys, we have the experience, and so we can do what we did last year easily, right? But with the experience that we have, yes, let's utilize that and be a little bit better. When we're healthy, we're, it's pretty hard to beat us. You know, when Taysom Hill is on the field, it's pretty hard to stop him. And if Jamal can be on his game and I can be on my game and everyone else, then who do you pick to guard? Who do you pick to cover? Who do you pick to put your focus on? And that's what we want to pride ourselves in is being unstoppable. And we feel like when we have our quarterback on the field, we are pretty hard to stop. So Greg, BYU wants to throw the football. The question always is, can Taysom throw the football effectively, and can he throw it at the volume and with the statistics that they're looking for? Well, when he got injured last year, uh, he was passing at 67%. You can certainly deal with that. That, that. that was a great leap for Taysom from the year before. Had he continued on that pace, he would have had a three, three to 4,000 yard season. It's actually, it's actually been five straight years without a 3,000 yard passer for BYU. And since 1972, when Lavelle came in, I think that's the longest stretch of seasons without a 3,000-yard guy. Now, it's just a number, 3,000, but it kind of illustrates where you are with the pass game. And, uh, and Christian Stewart, we should say, got pretty close <laughs> as, as only a part of the season guy last year. He certainly had that skill. But that would be the expectation, I think, for Taysom Hill. Be in the 60s, get to that 3,000-yard mark, and spread the ball around. All right, that's the offense. It's about time to get defensive. It's more work for me, but I think it gets like in the best chance. Bronco is back in charge of the defense. Why did he make that move? His answer when we come back.
Well, last season, Nick Howell was the guy calling plays for the BYU defense. This season, though, the head coach, Bronco Mendenhall, will once again take over those duties. Bronco explains why, and the players weigh in on what it means for them. Coach Mendenhall is a, is a defensive genius. He's really smart at what he does, um, but I think it just adds a sense of confidence. And honestly, I don't know why that is. Mendenhall, nothing flies. I mean, if you're jogging, you might as well just get out of practice. And uh, I feel like that's the standard he holds. And even if he's just watching us, I mean, you're going to give it everything you want because that's just how Mendenhall is. I just feel a lot more confident with him in control. Um, and he, you know, his teams that he's coached before have proven to have great defenses. So I think you'll see that again in the fall. I grew up watching Bronco coach. I was at you know, all those games and I loved his defense. I loved how he, you know, calls, calls his plays. Having someone who has that much experience, there's just so much confidence from guys on, uh, guys on the defense. Tricked with an interception to the end zone touchdown. I feel like him as a, as a person, he's a very, uh, he knows what he wants. And so he's, when he comes in that first day of fall camp, he's, he's going to make sure that we're running the football with relentless effort, that we're, we're tackling correctly, that we're doing everything the right way, making sure we know our assignments. We trust him and we know what um, he's capable of doing with our defense and we're just anxious to get started. I think that the group is willing. It's, they're far a far cry from where they're going to need to be in terms of not only expectation and commitment and performance, but I think they're willing. And the intent moving to the defense is just to give our team with our current staff the best chance to perform well. Uh, a year ago, I asked one of my best friends to take a less experienced group with fewer coaches and playing more plays to have a similar result. I, I like rolling up my sleeves and being involved in that and adding one more resource back into that room with more experience uh, makes the workload more manageable and gives us the best chance for a, a result that's been pretty consistent over all the years before then. And so I think our coaches and team know that. It's more work for me, but I think it gives our team the best chance. Craig, there seems to be a different vibe now that Bronco is back in charge of the defense. Why is that? I think there's a notion of accountability that returns to that side of the ball with Bronco taking a more hands-on approach. Uh, Bronco felt that the offense needed his input last year. He wanted to make himself the head coach of the entire team, have more of his impact felt kind of on both sides of the ball. I think he realizes uh, things are in pretty good hands with Robert and I, and the defense needs him uh, more or as much as they used to before. And I really think that accountability becomes the primary factor involved there. Give us one person on the defensive side of the football you say, this is the guy we've got to watch this year. Well, it's, it's, it's kind of, I mean, it's, it's not going to be a surprise, but when I say Bronson Kofusi, yeah. uh, we're going to see him back at his, at his, his more, most natural position. And what you want to see from, from the defensive line and, and the defensive ends in particular is some havoc in the backfield. There wasn't enough of that for BYU last year, as Bronson was kind of being moved around quite a bit. I think back at his regular spot, you see a little more havoc. All right, you ready to get pumped up? Greg? Ready oh, oh yeah, up? I'm ready. Yeah. We're going to do that when we come back. <laughs> And welcome back to the special edition of Sports Beat College Football Preview, all about the Cougars wrapping it up here. Greg, last season, Cougars got off to a great start, 4-0, looked to be having a special season. Yeah, then came all the injuries and a four-game losing streak, but with so many key players back, including Taysom and Jamal, this senior class hopes to finally break through with a special season. Here's a sample of what to expect from the Cougars this fall.
All right, guys, if that didn't pump you up, I don't know what will. It's about ready to kick things off on a great schedule, Greg. And what we need to know about BYU, we're going to know pretty early. By the end of September, you'll have a really good idea of what kind of team this is going to be. It all starts September 5th at Nebraska. Can't wait. Thanks, Greg. You bet. Jeremiah, thanks for watching. See you later. Next week, it's all about the Aggies.